So I brought my Bible with me, my little one, not this big one, but my little one. And uh, all week, I was dwelling and thinking about what I want to share this Sunday. And I had been studying for a while about the temple, and you know, about Jerusalem and the third temple that's going to be built and the prof- the prophecies that are going to come out of that. And out of that, the Lord was speaking to me these words. The threshing floor. You put that up there. The threshing floor. Wheat from chaff. And I started thinking, I said, Lord, what is it you're trying to say? And he said to me that every single person that becomes a Christian, and sometimes people think, you know, becoming a Christian, everything's going to be rosy, everything's going to be fine, you know. You're going to be on cloud nine. You will be on cloud nine until it rains and you fall to the earth. <laughs> You've got to come back to reality. You experience the joy of the Lord and all of those things. But then something happens. I believe you've got to start learning to walk, just like a baby. You know, when a baby first is born, he can't even crawl. He just can just, you know, wiggle around and stuff. And then he begins to crawl. And then from that stage, he begins to take steps. But he stumbles along the way. And, it, and oftentimes he falls. But then he gets right back up again, and he keeps on walking. And the Lord said the threshing floor is the place that every single Christian has to go to. Now, many of us in today's, you know, terminology of definitions of words, we've come so far away that we don't even know some of the words that used to be used a long time ago. Such as cassette tape. Now, some of us who are a little bit older remember a cassette. How many remember cassette tapes? Okay. How many remember eight tracks? How many remember 78s? How many remember 45s? You don't remember 45? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I know you were, uh, yeah. Well, you ask somebody, what is a record? You know what a record is? And they don't have any clue what a record is. There was a time when somebody was gay meant to be happy. But today, if I said I was gay, (laughs) I'd be in trouble. Words change. And so I want to explain to you the definition of the word Threshing floor, because a lot of us think of a wooden floor, or we think. But a threshing floor was a hard, level surface in which corn and other grain is threshed with a, uh, what's called a flail or a winnowing fork. Now, if you could put that other slide up for me for a moment, I want to show you. This is what's a picture of a threshing floor. It was a flat surface. It didn't have to be poured cement. It could have been just a flat surface, a rock or a a bunch of rocks or whatever. But this was known as a threshing floor. And they would take the wheat and they would harvest the wheat and they'd come and they put this wheat on this floor. And go to the next picture, please. And what they would do is they'd get oxen and they'd get a flatbed like that and they'd have some people sit on it. And they would go there and what it would do is it would crush the chaff, so that it would crack. And then you see the others with the forks there. The winnowing forks or the flails. And what they do, if you can go to the next picture, is they toss it up in the air. 
And when they toss it up in the air, what happens is the chaff, because it's lighter, the wind blows it away, and the seed, which is a little bit heavier, falls right to the ground. And it's called separating the chaff from the wheat. Now, that's just an explanation of what a threshing floor is. But the threshing floor in Scripture is a very important place. How many have ever heard of a threshing floor before? You've heard of it. Has anyone studied that before? No. We, sometimes we just read things and we know it's there, but we don't study what it is there for. But many, many things happened at the threshing floor in the Scriptures, and I just want to go over a few of them if, if I can. First of all, the threshing floor was a place where people met to mourn when someone died. Why is that? Because if you understand the, the Hebrew background of agriculture, that wheat is what produced bread, which produced life. They didn't have all of the restaurants we have today as we drive down the road. We could choose maybe 100 restaurants to go to. Their meals consisted of agriculture, whatever was grown, and fish. Maybe some lamb, a goat. But they really depended upon bread as the sustenance of life. They really reared that bread was the life source of their culture. Remember the little boy that had the baskets? Five loaves and two fish? It was the way that they would sustain their life. Now, when I said that they go to the threshing floor to mourn the dead, it's because it was a place that was, a, was used to produce life. Remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So let's look for a moment in Genesis 50, verse 10 and 11. And I'll read it here. It says, when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation when they came to the threshing floor. They would come to this place, and they would mourn. It says here, and it says, They lamented in sorrowfulness, and he observed seven days of mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore it was named Abel Mizarim, which is beyond the Jordan. Did you know that they crossed the Jordan before Joshua crossed the Jordan? Amen. It was a place of mourning, a place of sorrow, a place that they knew that there was something after death. It was not not just annihilation. It was a place to bring comfort to know that though they are gone from this life, they are still living in another, in another place. You'll find that the threshing floor was a place where you could learn God's will. Where you could learn God's will. Look at Judges 6.37. He says, Behold, I will put out Put a fleece of wool. You got that? Okay. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool. Go to the H.C., uh, the Holman Bible. I will put a fleece of wool here on the threshing floor. On the threshing floor. I'll put a fleece of wool there. If dew is only on the fleece, 
and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will deliver Israel by the strength you have said. So they were looking for a place that they could find God's will. And they would put that fleece on the threshing floor. It's very interesting when you go through these things. It was also a place to go and meet one's kingsman redeemer. Look in Ruth chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 2 to uh, from verse 2 if I can. You can use the same version, that's fine. Now, isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with this young woman? This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, Boaz was a very rich man, very wealthy. This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Verse 3, please. Wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Go down, where? To the threshing floor. But don't let the man know that you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. Verse 4. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. When you laid at, at, the, at a master's feet and you uncovered his feet, you were there, you would snuggle your body next to his feet to keep his feet warm. It was a place of humility and submission, but it was also a place of surrender. And it all took place where? On the threshing floor. I got excited about that. I don't know about you. In that story on Ruth, you know, it goes on to say that you know, when he woke up, he was startled, and he saw Ruth at his feet. And he said, we are relatives. He says, he, says, and he says, I am a Kingsman Redeemer. Can I tell you, before it's all said and done, in your Christian life, you're going to go through the threshing floor experience. It was also a place of security and provision. That doesn't sound good. I showed you what takes place on the threshing floor. It was a crushing, it was a pulverizing to a point of getting that chaff broken so that the seed can be loosened from it. It was hard work. It was crushing. But then out of that came the seed or the wheat so that it could sustain life. Can I tell you, in your Christian experience, if you want to see life come out of you, there has to be a death. Many, many years ago, I preached a message about Joseph and about his dreams. And I said this one thing. Before God can accomplish your dreams, that dream must go through the death process. Joseph didn't get the promise of sitting at the right hand of Pharaoh till his dream died. Jesus said it this way, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and it abides alone. But if it dies, what happens? It brings forth much fruit. So out of death comes life. You cannot have the life without the death. Amen. And he could not have experienced that freedom 
unless that hatred died. And once that hatred died and was no longer in effect, she walked in freedom of life. And that wasn't planned, by the way. It was a place of security and provision on this threshing floor. Leviticus 26, verse 5. Leviticus 26, verse 5. The threshing floor. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest. And the grape harvest will continue until sowing time. You will have plenty of food to eat and live securely in the land. At the threshing floor is the place where God begins to change you and I. The threshing floor is the place where we can be secure in Him. When we put our trust and our, and, our, and our hope in the things of this world, in our abilities, and what we can accomplish, it will fall and, f and fail. You heard the expression, only this one life soon shall pass, only that's done, what's done for Christ will last. That's true. God will provide for you. God will provide for me. He always does. In the 40 years I've been serving the Lord, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen us forsaken or begging for bread. Linda and I, then we've gone through some real shallow times, but yet we've still had bread to eat. We still had food on our table. It's a place of secure and a place of prosperity and a place of blessing and a place of provision. But it's at the threshing floor. It's at the threshing floor. That grinding, that that pressure, that situation you go through, the things that you go through, those pressure, that time that you go through, that's the threshing floor experience. And God will bring it out of that into life. But you got to go through the process. There's no other way. You can go to the doctor and he'll give you a pill. But it won't be the gospel. <laughs> but the threshing floor is a place of security and provision. It's a place that God begins to mold and shape and to shake off. And he begins to reveal to our hearts and to our minds the things that we need to forsake. And that's throwing up the chaff and the wheat together up in the air. And then when the Holy Spirit, the wind of God, blows, it begins to separate the chaff from the wheat. It's also a place of judgment. If you look at this from the aspect of the characters of who God is, it's amazing. 2 Samuel 6.6. 6. You're going to see some things you go, wow, I never saw that before. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Yuza reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the ox had stumbled it. But it's not a coincidence. It was at the threshing floor. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, the threshing floor is a place 
where it is done God's way and not your way. No chastisement seems to be joyous for the moment. No correction seems to be good for the moment. But God has a way. The threshing floor is God's way. God spoke and told the Israelites many years before, you don't touch the ark, you don't go near the ark. Only the priests were able to handle the ark, and that was through poles that went into the ark, and they would take the ark and carry it on their shoulders. And they would take so many paces, and they'd sacrifice. And they'd take so many paces, and they would sacrifice. God says you're not to touch that thing. And though user was doing a good thing, but I believe God would have rather seen the ark fall over than disobedience. See, man tries to compromise the things of God and says, well, God doesn't mind. God doesn't mind if I touch that ark because he understands my heart. That's what the saying is today. No, God understands your heart. He'll kill you. Ananias and Sapphira knew God's heart. It's New Testament. Under the dispensation of grace. And they held back part of the portion of money. Did God let it slide? Did he? No. He would draw the breath right out of them and they both dropped dead right there. Imagine having that kind of a service. Pastor takes an offering and you said you were going to give something to the Lord, you didn't give it, and all of a sudden, two people dropped dead, what would you think? I didn't get the checkbook. <laughs> it was a place of God's judgment. When they came to the threshing floor, It's not all bad. It was a place of security and provision, which is true. It was a place of mourning. It was a place to find the Kingsman Redeemer. But it's a place of judgment. But it's also a place where prophets prophesy. 1 Kings 22.10. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in royal attire, were each sitting on his own throne. And they were on the threshing floor at the entrance to Samaria's gate. And all the prophets were prophesying in front of them. When you are willing to go through the threshing floor experience, because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. You can have a PhD, you still won't understand the things of God. You'll understand the historical aspects of it. But the spiritual aspects of it, you won't understand. There were the Pharisees who were the most educated Jews of their time. PhD levels, if you will. Master's degree levels. From the authentic Israeli protege from their lineage. The best. And Jesus called them white-walled sepulchers. Bunch of religious hypocrites. And they consulted together and conspired together to kill the Jesus. 
if they had spiritual insight and they could see and understand, they would know that Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, was their Messiah. But until this day, many of the Jews do not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Only until you go through the threshing floor experience will you begin to hear the prophetic word. You'll hear the prophet speak. And if there's ever a time that the church of Jesus Christ needs to hear the prophetic voice of God, it is today. And I'm not talking about prophesying how much money you're going to get or what kind of house you're going to live in. Or, or, or a prophecy about you and how great you're going to be. I'm talking about a prophetic word that God will give the church to open their eyes to the time in which we live. A voice that will cry out in the wilderness and say, that is wrong and this is wrong and God does not like it. He does not approve of it. No matter what the cost. I don't know if it was Annie or it was Linda or some, somebody was reading something on Facebook where a woman lost her job. Was it a teacher? Was it a teacher? I forget what it was. But a teacher lost her job because of what was it again? Yes, she, she would not acknowledge the transgender. She would not, she would not change the pronoun and address the transgender as a she. Lost her job. If you don't think it's getting dangerous, I saw some place where they said that if you will not acknowledge them, then you deserve to go to jail. Even now, Muslims in this country, in this country, a saying that if you speak anything derogatory against the Muslim faith, you should be thrown in jail. I'm telling you, you need to hear the prophetic voice of God, but it only comes at the threshing floor, the place of brokenness, the place where you are crushed and, and winnowed. That's the only place you're going to hear. Otherwise, you will go along with the world. And let me tell you something. It's not only the world, it's the church. The church is blind. The church is naked. The church cannot see properly. Read Revelation about the lukewarm church. You're poor, miserable, blind, naked. Wow. Jesus said that, not me. Don't get mad at me. He said that about the Laodicean church. He said, you're poor, you're blind, you're miserable, you're naked. All you think the church is about is money and prestige and success. Look at where the church is today. That's where they are, the big churches. They're considered successful because they have 800, 900, 1,000 people. Some have 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 members. I believe Yonki Cho in, in Korea, I believe he has over 2 million members. Several thousand pastors. One church. But I always say this to you. It doesn't matter how small or how big your church is. Jesus had a church of 9,000, and that's not counting the disciples. That's just 9,000. He fed 5,000 and 4,000. They followed Jesus. But when it came to the threshing floor of Calvary, where he had to be crushed to separate the chaff from the wheat, the world from the Christian, he suffered. And died. Hello? He took it. For you. But the church today, they don't want to hear the truth. The 
church today doesn't want to be committed. The church today is religious. When I was a Catholic, I was religious. I went to church once. No, I'm sorry, twice. Christmas and Easter. And as I was growing up, I went to church on Sundays. And you know my story. I lived in the West End. My mother would send me to church to give me a dollar or whatever it was. I don't remember. And I'd go and I'd sit in St. Lawrence Church in the back. As soon as they started, because when I was a kid, they started, you know, uh, the service in Latin. Nomine, nomine, nomino, domine, nina, nomine, nomine. I didn't have any idea what they were saying. I always thought they were saying, nobody can beat me playing dominoes. But right when they started that, I would, get, I would exit out of the church and I'd go to Goggins, which is now Dylan's. And I'd sit down and I'd have me a frap. And then I'd take the money that was left over and I'd go back in time to church and I'd sit down and then just in time for the guy to pass the basket and I'd drop the money in the basket. And I'd go home and my mother say, did you go to church? I said, yes, I did. Did you put money in the basket? I said, yes, I did. I didn't lie. I did. I went to church. I didn't say how long. I did put money in the basket. I didn't say how much. But we can become like that as Christians. Not discerning the time in which we live. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see the day. But you cannot see it unless you go through the threshing process. You just become religious. Sunday's good enough. And it's sad. You won't hear the place of prophetic prophecy. I had a dream the other day of someone, I'm not going to tell you who it is either, so don't bug me, laying dead in a coffin. Now, that could have been something spiritual or something physical. I'll wait on God. And the last time that God showed me someone in the coffin, they died physically. Even Linda doesn't know. Never told her. Not going to either, so don't bug me. We need to hear a gen not these false prophets that are out there saying, come on down the line, you stand in the $50 prophecy line, you stand in the $100 prophecy line. And the more money you give, the greater the prophecy. A bunch of lying devils, I'll tell you right now. And I'll tell right here on Facebook. They're a bunch of lying devils. You cannot receive the deeper things of God without going through the threshing floor. It was also a place of offering. Numbers 15, verse 20. Numbers 15, verse 20. It says, of the first of your dough. <laughs> I like that. You are to offer a loaf from your first batch of dough as a contribution. Offer it just like a contribution from the threshing floor. You know how God likes your offerings? Oh, gee, I got to give my tithe. I you know. Lord, really? Okay, I'll give it. No. The Bible said God loves a cheerful giver. Where's the basket? We'll take another offering. Uh, you see, I saw a couple of faces going. God loves a cheerful giver. 
And you give from the threshing floor, from the newness of life, not of the old letter of the law. You don't give because you have to. You give because you want to. You give because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an ordinance of God's word that you want to be obedient to. The offering of the threshing floor. So you shall lift it up. It's a place of sharing. Threshing floor, floor is a place of sharing. Deuteronomy 15, 14. I'm going to wear your thumbs out. Give sparingly. <laughs> Give generously to him from your flock, your threshing floor, your wine press. You are to give him whatever the Lord your God has blessed you with. When I wasn't saved, when I was just religious, I was more concerned about me than I was the church. I went to the Catholic church. I sat down. I listened for a little while. Went out, had a milkshake, came back, threw whatever was left. I gave God whatever was left. Hello? But when I've gone through the threshing floor into newness of life, I give shape. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give back into your bosom. Come on now. I'm telling you. You could never, ever outgive God. I'll tell you a quick story. I have to tell you a quick story because I got a few more here. True story. I think some of you might have heard it before, but there was a little church, and they had a building project that they had been saving for five years. And over that five-year period, they were able to save $50,000. And um, they found out that one of the largest churches in the county was moving to a 25-acre a, a plot of land about four or five miles down the road and they were going to build this mega church he had like some like 5,000 members so he came and he to visit this little pastor of this little church they had about a hundred hundred or so people and he said he wanted to let them know that you know they would consider it an honor and a privilege to have him come and to pray with them when they had the dedication of the building and he agreed And before, when the building was being finalized, there was some time in between, the Lord began to speak to this little pastor in this church and said, I want you to give that $50,000 to that big church. And the pastor said, what? God, you know, we pray like this. God, don't you know that it took five years of saving for that money to build that extension we need? Five years we've been saving and scrimping and having, you know, bake sales and all doing all we can to raise the money so that we can have a, a down payment for the wing so that we can have the mortgage for that, for that wing that we need and desperately need. Don't you know that, Lord? And the Lord said, obey me. So like a good pastor, he went before the board, you know, and he said, listen, he said, I know it sounds crazy, but God told me we're supposed to give that 50000 to the dedication of that building. They said, Pastor, this is where reason can get you in trouble. When you use your reason above what God says. Because sometimes God will tell you something contrary to your reason. They said, Pastor, how can that be God? 
For God knows. He's the one that started this campaign for us to raise this money. And we all prayed and we all believed God was, was, was sacrificially giving to this program. And now you're saying God is saying to go and do that? Five years of our sweat and sacrifice? So they said, we're going to pray about it. So they asked the pastor to leave, and he left, and the board began to pray. They called him back in. They said, Pastor, you have been a man of God. You have led us for years. We have trusted your, your relationship with the Lord, and you've always brought us into the right pathway. So we're going to trust you with this. We don't really agree, but we are, we're going to trust you with this because we love you and we know that you hear from God. So he went to the dedication of this building. And he went up to the pastor and he gave him the envelope. And the pastor said, what's that? He said, the Lord spoke to me to give you this. And he opened it up and it was a check for $50,000. He said, I can't take this. He says, look, you got a, you're a small church. We've got 5,000 people. We've got more than enough. He said, I know, but God told me to do it. So he said, okay. So he received it. So the little church started to save again. And about a year went by. And this big church down the road, about four or five miles down the road, had a guest speaker from down south come and speak. And afterwards, he had brought a friend with him. They went into the pastor's office, and his friend said to the pastor, said, hey, listen to me. He says, listen, God's been very good to me. He says, I'm blessed. He says, I'm financially set. My family's set. My kids are set. He says, I have more money than I need. He says, do you know anybody that needs a blessing? I want to bless someone. And the pastor immediately said, yes, I do know somebody you can bless. There's a little church down the road about two, two, two four or five miles that was saving for an extension on their church. And he sacrificially gave us their down payment of $50,000. He said, no problem. Got out his checkbook, wrote out a check, put it in an envelope, said, could you have one of your elders bring it to him? I said, sure. So his elder goes down to the church after service, you know, and the pastor's there, and he says, can I see you in the office? He says, yeah. He goes down and says, listen. He said, my pastor told me to give you this. He says, a friend of his came down who has a friend, and he wanted to bless somebody, and he asked my pastor if I knew any, if he knew anybody that could, we could be a bless, he could be a blessing to. He said, yes, I know somebody. It's a little guy down the, the little church down the, down the street. So he said, he wanted me to give you this. He said, gee, thanks, you know, thank you very much. So everyone left, and he went to the office, and he sat down. And he opened the envelope, and he looked at the check, and he began to cry. It was a check for five hundred thousand dollars. True story. Which paid for the entire extension. But unless you go through that threshing floor and die to self, let it go. He would have not got that check for five hundred thousand. That's all I got. That's all I got. God, you know that's all I got. Hello. It's a place of sharing. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. It's a place, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a place of correction. Micah 412. Micah, M I C A H, 412. But they do not know the Lord's intentions. Or understand his plans, that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. This is a place of correction. God will bring you when you stubbornly refuse 
Now, there are some that don't know, but there are some that know and refuse to hear. How do they refuse to hear? By doing nothing. They hear a message. They get conviction for that moment. And they leave out of here and they continue on in the same pattern in the same way as they left, as they came. If that's you this morning, get ready for your threshing floor. But they do not know the Lord's intentions or understand his plans that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor because he wants to shake those things out of you. Now I come to my text. It's 5 of 12 and I'm only getting to my text. You say, Pastor, that's Old Testament. I say, no, that's Bible. Hmm. But if you want a New Testament example, Matthew 3.12. I want you to go to the King James Version because it uses, uses a different word there. Whose fan is in his hand. Go to the American Standard Version. It's got fan. What about, NI, uh, what about the T, uh, NLT? I'm sorry. I'm trying to find that version. There it is. He is ready? Who? Who's ready? Who's he speaking of? Jesus. Say it with me, Jesus. You all with me now? Okay. John the Baptist is speaking, saying he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. He will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but the burning of the chaff will never, with never ending fire. Wow. That's Jesus. He has a winnowing fork. Now, the analogy there is the church in the world. He's going to find out who is a true believer. There are many Christians walking around today. They're like the grains of wheat. They haven't been, they haven't been broken. Oh, but they say they're a Christian. They fellowship. Talk about Jesus. But only the ones that have gone to the threshing floor so that the chaff can be separated from the wheat. The chaff will not be separated from the wheat without the threshing floor. Without the first the grinding of that wheat to, to, to break open that chaff so that when it's winnowed and it's thrown into the air, the, the chaff will, will fly away and the seed will fall down. Jesus has a winnowing fork. Puts it into the wheat. And the separation begins. And those that are wheat, those that are the grain, he'll take into his bond. But those who are not the chaff, he will throw into never-ending fire. That's Jesus. Are you just a unbroken sheath of wheat? Or are you in a place where you're willing for God? 
I was reading a book. I got nine more pages to finish. I'll be all done. On my vacation, I was reading this book about a Muslim Egyptian who got saved, who got beat by his father, outcast by his family, couldn't get a job, was, was in, uh, investigated by ISS, which is a form of government officials, thrown into prison, sodomized in the prison, beaten in the prison, I forget how many days, how many weeks he was in solitary confinement, simply because he converted from Muslim to Christian. He said there were times where he began to doubt. There was times when he failed. There was a song by Keith Green many years ago. Do you hear? Do you hear? All the people. Oh, I forgot the name of that song. Don't you care? Don't you hurt? Don't you even shed one tear? How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and pretend the job's done. As a church, as a Christian, how many people have you brought to Jesus? And if you haven't brought anyone to Jesus, it's because you have not gone to the threshing floor in that particular area of your life. You're not willing to open your mouth and share the good news with somebody for fear of rejection or fear of not accepting, being accepted or whatever it may be. But a true biblical Christian is going to share with somebody the good news is going to share with them the love of Jesus. But pastor, you don't understand. I'll lose my job. So did this Muslim, ex-Muslim. They wouldn't hire him. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, pastor, in work I can't. That's right, you can't. But the Bible says, give an answer to those who ask. If someone asks you, you can, because you have permission. On your break, not during work, there are those that will stand instead of working, they're standing there talking about Jesus. That's wrong. Are you in the process of the threshing floor this morning? Has anything I said this morning registered in your spirit? This is how I'll, I'll know if I see changes. If I see changes in your behavior, changes in your, your life, where you start to make these changes that God has been speaking to you. Can I tell you, God when, God, when somebody stands up here and gives a testimony and says, God said to me, and they give whatever they give, that I need to do this, I need to do that, or whatever, and you don't do it, you are in big trouble, my friend. You are in big trouble. Better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not pay it. Don't let this world... Understand, I'm going to close with this. Understand that in the last days... Do you believe we're in the last days? How many believe? Let me show, show me your hands. You, believe, you really believe that we're in the last days? Well, if we're in the last days, not years days then why are you living like you're living why do you do the things you do why do you put God on the burner and put him second place in your life hello if we're living in the last days he said this know this know this he said know this 
that in the last days, many shall fall away from the faith. They'll be religious. They'll still go to church. But they'll find a church that is pleasing to their flesh where there's no threshing floor experience. And my friend, that is the church that the Antichrist will win over. That is the church that will be deceived and fall into that place of acceptance of the Antichrist. I read somewhere, I read that it is the United Nations or NATO, one of the two, I don't remember, but one of the two that said within 12 years they want a new world order, a one world government in 12 years. It's happening. It's happening. You don't, may not see it, but the only way you're going to see it and the only way you're going to perceive it and the only way you're going to hear it is going to be through God's prophets he's going to raise up in the last days. You say, oh, well, pastor, I don't know if he's going to do that. I don't know if he's going to raise up prophets like to read your Bible. What is God going to raise up for Israel in the last days in the book of Revelation? I've been studying this too. Two witnesses. Hello? Do you know what those two witnesses are? I believe Enoch and Elijah. Do you know they were both prophets? If you want to hear what this word has got to say, it cannot be with the natural ears because it goes in one ear and out the other. It's got to be with the spiritual mindset. It's got to be with the spiritual ears and spiritual understanding that you can only get that through the threshing floor experience. A flat surface. You know the cross was a flat surface? I'm going to end with this. You can know that if you leave this place today, and on your way home you get into a head-on collision and you die, you can know you're going to heaven. See, the devil knows his time is short. The devil knows his time is short. You can feel it in the atmosphere. This is no time to retreat. No time to step back. We sang that song this morning. I won't go back. I won't go back to the way it used to be. But can I tell you, little by little, you will. If you don't have ears to hear what the Spirit of God says. I don't care who you are. I follow the Lord and I backslid. It doesn't matter who you are. That's pride and arrogance to think that, oh, that never happened to me. It happens so subtly, you cannot even perceive it. But you begin to get a little more colder, a little more colder, a little more colder, a little more compromising, a little more compromising, a little more compromising. And what ends up happening is you begin to fall away. God said it's going to happen to those that are in church. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many go in there, but narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Are you ready for God's threshing floor? I am. He put me on the threshing floor. There are things that he's challenging me with, things that I need to do, things I need to do better. 
but I'm willing. You understand what I'm saying? I am willing to do those things. If you need Jesus, you need to receive him into your life. I just want to pray for you now. I'm going to pray for a general prayer for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now, Father, that those listening to my voice will not hear me, will hear you through me. What the Holy Spirit said today, Father, seal it in their hearts. Let them never forget the place of the threshing floor. May they study it on their own and go into the Word and begin to study it. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, I believe it's 1 Chronicles or 2 Chronicles 3.1. Maybe, Pastor, you could put up 2 Chronicles 3.1 for me. I think it's 2 Chronicles 3.1. Mark this Bible. Mark this scripture down. Can you put that up there, Tom, please? 2 Chronicles 3.1. So Solomon built to the... So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Anna, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The house of God was built on the threshing floor. You are the house of God. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. We're all the temple of God. We need to be built on that threshing floor, just like the house was naturally, is the same way the house will be built spiritually. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would take these scriptures and this word today. Bless those on Facebook. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in with us. Remember, if you need Jesus, Just cry out to him right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my life and be Lord and master of my life. I receive you now in the sacrifice on the cross, and I believe that you were raised from the dead on the third day. And according to your word, Lord, I'm saved. If you said that prayer right to us, we'll send you some material. Now, Father, I pray for the congregation that you bless them. Bless their going in, their coming out, their lying down, their rising up. And Father, bless them on their way home. Give them.